thank you for joining us this evening for cross-border dialogues with Heather Atone in conversation with Ryan Rice. This conversation is moderated by Sally Freider tonight. Um, and so uh, I'm Nicole Neufeld and I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph, who is the organization hosting this event this evening. And so as we start our time together, I'd like to suggest a moment of reflection to contemplate the place where we're gathering, though physically distanced online, virtually, um, but let us all contemplate the land on which we each live, work and create. Myself as a second generation Canadian of Eastern European background, I know that I've been granted privileges and the privilege to live on this land. I have access that others do not have um, and may not experience. And so I do think about land acknowledgements as a reminder to confront the ongoing realities of colonialism and of the structures in which we live, the conflicts and violences experienced today due to colonial powers, and here at the Art Gallery of Guelph, a cultural institution that is based on deeply colonial methods of representation, I remind myself that we need to continue to push back against those colonial structures underpinning our institution, the ways we operate, along with the structures impacting people's everyday realities. Um, so let's also acknowledge that land acknowledgements are far from enough and that we need to take concrete action towards reconciliation, doing so with intention and gratitude. So here where I am at the Art Gallery of Guelph, uh, this is the place that we now call Guelph, Ontario. It's on the ancestral lands of the Atawandran people and the Treaty 3 territory and lands of the Mississaugas. This land carries rich indigenous history and it's also home to First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. It will be for generations to come and has been for generations past. So I invite you in joining me in offering our respect to our Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors here, recognizing that we have much work to do to strengthen our relationships within our communities. And let's offer our respect to the elders of this land, of the past, of the present, and the future. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Sally Freider, who's moderating the conversation. Um, it's been a great um, a great honor to have the chance to work with Sally over the years here uh, at the Art Gallery um, when she was the curator of contemporary art here. Um, and she's now, of course, moved on as the senior curator and curatorial manager at the Remy Modern in Saskatoon. Sally is the daughter of immigrants from the Caribbean. Curatorial, curatorially, she is interested in decolonial praxis, space and place, Black and Caribbean diasporas, photography, art of the everyday, and issues of equity and representation in museological spaces. She has curated solo and group exhibitions for institutions such as the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Art Gallery of Guelph, the Olerich Museum of Art, the Glassell School of Art and Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, and the Justina M. Barnaki Gallery at the University of Toronto, Project Row Houses, and Center Three for Artistic and Social Practice. And now, as I mentioned, she's the Senior Curator and Curatorial Manager at the Rene Martin. And I'll turn it over to Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I am gonna echo your remarks and just thank everyone who's joining us this evening. Um, I'm joining you from Treaty 6 territory from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, and I'm really excited about tonight's conversation. I say that at the outset of every single conversation, but it's been true. Um, we'll be speaking with two people whose work I've admired for a very long time um, and whose efforts I think have significantly shaped the way that Indigenous art and Indigenous arts discourse, particularly contemporary Indigenous art and Indigenous art discourse um, throughout Canada and the United States States has um, unfolded for the for over a decade. Um, I've been following Ryan's curatorial practice since 2008. We first met when we were both on a panel for the Ming Tiampo organized um, complicated entanglements panel that took place at Carleton University. And Nicole also worked on it. And I had the pleasure of meeting Heather um, through the EPIC program at AMC 
in 2022. Um, and her work has had a profound effect on me in terms of the way that I think about interpretation and community engagement. And, uh, you know, at those moments where you kind of lose faith, like it re it re it reaffirms that the work that we do as curators um, does not exist in a vacuum and that it's necessary and vital work. So I'm going to begin by reading Ryan's bio and Ryan sent this very modest bio, which does not, you know, cover the half of what he has accomplished in his curatorial career to date. Um, but hopefully the conversation that we have tonight will tease, tease out um, many of his achievements. Um, so Ryan Rice, I'm gonna take off my glasses to read this. Ryan Rice, Kenyan Kehaka of Kenawake is a curator, critic and creative consultant based in Toronto. His institutional and independent cura curatorial career spans 30 years in community, museums, artist-run centers, public spaces, and gallery. Rice focuses his extensive curatorial research and writing on contemporary, and I'm gonna stumble over this even though I practiced it, Ho Kwe Han Kwe art. In 2022, he co-curated the 2023 Bonavista Biennale in Newfoundland, and he was appointed to OCAD University's on-site gallery as the executive director alongside his curator, Indigenous Art Post. He consistently contributes to multiple communities to advance leadership and organizational experiences in the arts and culture sector. And Heather Aton is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and descendant of strong Choctaw women. She currently serves as Director of Curatorial Affairs at First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and has worked in the Native arts community since 1993. Dr. Aton has established a career as a curator, arts writer, and cultural researcher she serves on numerous advisory boards and in professional capacities that advocate on behalf of Indigenous knowledge, museum practice, and scholarship in the field, including current service as, or I guess it was a recent tenure that has recently ended, as the president for the Native American Art Studies Association and on the American Art Journal editorial board. Her current research explores the intersection between Indigenous cultural knowledge and contemporary arts. Aton has worked at the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum, now MOCNA, the Southwestern Association of Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and on contract with Ralph Applebaum Associates, New York, and in several positions at the University of Oklahoma, where she served as the curator of Native American and non-Western art at OU Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art for over six years. So again, welcome. And I'm going to open with my first question, which is, and I'm going to ask you to respond first, Ryan, can you please speak about an early formative experience with art that in retrospect, like you're now looking back and realizing that that had an impact on the way that you thought of or conceived of art or your entry into working in, in the arts field? All right, Ryan, are you on mute? I think you might be on mute. Yeah, here we go, there we go. Okay, okay awesome. Yeah, I just wanna start off by saying Yawakoa, thank you for the invitation to be part of this conversation. I'm very excited to be in conversation with Heather tonight because uh, our circles and paths cross many, many years over. Uh, and jumping, diving right into your first question, I guess I think I go back to thinking that the answer is church. And church, not in a religious way, but in a way where it was uh, a pattern or a, or a habit that uh, my family, we got in the car on Saturday morning and went to church. The church in Ganawage, my, my community just outside of Montreal, is quite a, quite an elaborate church. If you, if you think about it and start looking at it and understanding it beyond this colonial structure that's within the community, 
you understand that it was it was built in 1720. So it's almost over 300 years old. Mm -hmm. And through the weekly grind of going through this process where we didn't even know why we went to church. We just knew that it was part of the practice. Um, in the church was an opportunity to be creative, to imagine through the lens of the artwork that was in the church. And I actually, I did research on this in the past and today I had to re uh, Google it. And there's frescoes all over the top of the church by an Italian painter from Quebec, whose name is Guida, Guido Nincheri. And he painted these frescoes in 1925. So the ceiling is full of the very Da Vinci-esque and, you know, all these religious, you know, with the clouds in the sky. And it was something to do over the half hours to look up and just imagine, like, what is this? How did this happen? Who are these people? They don't look like us. We have no relations. And then looking to the side was very ornate sculptures of uh, the stations of the cross. And then understanding how violent this was, like every time returning to church was looking at the violence along the wall and the violence in front of us of the crucifix, but then looking to like the heavens and all the, the pastel-y colors. And, and so I think that was sort of like my first, how art piqued my curiosity because we didn't go to museums, we didn't, you know, but the, the other thing that was quite fascinating was in Ganawaga, we have the uh, Saint Gadarita Gakwita, uh, who was not a saint yet at the time. She, I think she was benef benef benefactored or something, whatever. So her bones were within the church. Um, hmm. her bones were as relics were spread across the world to different places. So there was this particular bench that you would kneel on and it had a glass case and there was a sample of a, like a, a, a knee bone or something like that. So it was like this weird, you know, it was like, you know, like a freak show kind of thing. And it was like kind of cool to go see it but not knowing, really knowing what that was. So I think that was the first impact of like how visual language or visual culture was entering at an early age. I think I think that's, that's for me, that's what it was. Um, that is really fascinating. And that was not the response I was expecting. <laughs> um, and uh, Heather, could you share with us an early experience of yours? Yeah, so I um, grew up really um, personally much more uh, thinking my, my professional career would take me into the sciences. Um, I have a strong sense of sort of systemic um, uh, structure and analysis, but um, I was raised by a, a single mom. And when we were, I lived in a lot of places growing up. And when we were in Denver, um, there was a time when my sister and I would have days off from school and my mom as a single mom would she'd put a dollar for me and a dollar for my sister on the dining room table when she left to work and we could do whatever we wanted with that dollar I think she probably thought we went around the corner to like the arcade back when you actually dropped quarters in a, a machine and probably spent our time at that arcade but my I, I've always been a little adventurous and ambitious and so um, my sister and I figured out how to uh, take the bus from Aurora, Colorado, all the way to downtown um, Denver, which is quite a trek now that I'm an adult. I think I was crazy, but um, we'd ride the public transportation into downtown um, Denver, walk around a little bit, and then we would go and like hang out at like the Denver Art Museum because there was free admission and they had a cafe at that time where you could get a grilled cheese sandwich and a bowl of tomato soup for like a dollar 50. I'm sure it was probably on the menu for their employees more than it was for guests, but my sister and I could pull our $2 and have enough to do that and buy like a pop or whatever on the way home. And um, so it would be an adventurous day for us. Sometimes we do that. We'd go to the zoo, similar adventures. But um, one day we we're like running around and I'm 11. That probably puts my sister at eight. 
And uh, we're running around in the old Denver Museum and there was, um, we were on the floor where the native arts were. I can remember the blue corn room was installed. I mean, there's very distinct things I have in my memory of that experience, but there was something that was on a platform that every time I passed it, I felt like it was like trying to get my attention and I couldn't figure out what it was. And quite frankly, I don't like losing my sister and we were playing a tag game. And so, you know, I didn't want to stop it. Finally, I just stopped and I looked at the label and what we were standing in front of was a cradle board that had been made by my great grandmother, my grandfather's mother. Um, and I saw her name and, you know, I realized that I probably had been recognizing some of the designs in the, um, in the cradle board um, beaded beadwork that were familiar and probably that familiarity was catching my attention. I've come since to have a sense to belief that I do believe these objects have a life and that they are engaged with us as humans um, in the work that we're doing. And so I, you know, I, I, I don't want to go so far to say that at that moment that I had that cognizant sort of sense of it, but the, the cradle board called to me and I had ha heard stories about, um, my great grandmother from my mom and from my grandfather. And um, I didn't have any personal memories of her. She passed while I was still quite young. And um, when I was sitting there, standing there with my sister, looking at the cradle board label, it was like the, whoever had written this label didn't know anything about her and didn't seem to understand what an important role that we understood her to have played in the community as a cradle board maker or how well respected she was within the community. It was very much just a simple diagnosis of the materials, right? It was all, that was all the label really conveyed. And if you didn't know better, you would just think it was not that important of a thing. And yet I and my sister both stood there and I remember in my little 12, 11, 12 year old head, thinking to myself, whoever wrote this is an idiot, you know, <laughs> and, and I think now that maybe I was challenging the universe to put me in a position where it would become my responsibility to write those labels and understand that it is important to acknowledge the people who are engaged, even I was privileged in that moment that it had her name attached to it for me to at least acknowledge and see that relationship. There's so many indigenous objects in museum collections that there are not names attached to it. And I think that this is a an important call to the communities. Um, we can't put names to everything, but certainly there's a lot of misinformation and um, collection records that needs to be corrected and um, and that the communities, whether or not they know who made it, these objects have relatives in the tribal communities and our institutions really have a responsibility to pursue um, reconnecting, reuniting those objects with their relatives. Mm -hmm. um, you have both touched on a lot of really important points with these introductory anecdotes that I think we're gonna we're gonna come back to later on in the conversation. Um, but now we're going to veer off into a slightly different direction. Um, can you please like talk to us about how you came to curating? Were you familiar with what curatorial work entailed before you, um, you know, set on that path to becoming curators? Uh, can you share the training that you undertook both in institutional contexts? So anything like internships or fellowships, um, academic study, um, and also non-traditional training that you undertook as well, non-traditional. Okay, so Ryan, we'll ask you. Uh, I guess, I mean, I came to this field through uh, pursuing an art degree, mm -hmm. an art career, being an artist. Uh, but I always think about how much curatorial practice was a privilege and still is a privilege. It's still something that many people don't understand what a curator does, who a curator is, how do you become a curator, what do you actually do as a curator? So it's sort of, uh, I came to it in, in, a, in a very practical way. I mean, mm -hmm. I pursued... Uh, art school. I, I went to the Institute of American Indian Arts in 1984. 
Uh, I seen a different world that I didn't see back home. I seen uh, activity, people showing up. I seen presence. I seen agency. Uh, it was very commercial, but I, I seen all that. And I learned within that realm of, I sucked it all up when I went there. I, went, I was there for two years and I really took in as much as possible as I could. I took advantage of everything that I I, I was able to participate in terms of traveling everywhere with the school, museum club, uh, ski club, uh, movie club, like the whole, because it was that was the world for me for two years. And it all evolved around art. Um, art that had a relationship to me, art that I wasn't foreign from, art that uh, I felt comfortable around. Um, and, and, it, and it took, it took, the, it was the dominant structure of, of how we were learning. Like I, I learned clay with Adelaide Lolama and I spent two years in the studio with her. I thought I would be making clay today, yeah. switched over to printmaking and printmaking has really informed my practice as a curator, just because how management, how, 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 how technically you have to be on the ball when you do that type of work. Right. Um, and curatorial practice came through organizing, through figuring out how I would end up showing my own work. How do I have a career? Where do I start? Uh, you know, that whole dream that, that, you know, that what you think of someone's going to find you or give you a show was something not, you know, there was no reality to that. And yeah. uh, starting to make things happen. DIY on my own. I, I had my first solo exhibition in a hair salon, a black community hair salon in NDG, Montreal. Um, you know, and then just working more closely with other Indigenous artists who were in Montreal at the university, also trying to figure out those ways of, of getting their work out in public. The, the museum's doors were closed. The gallery's doors were closed. Uh, anytime we would have conversations with any of these people who are still in place today, they would say, go, that's ethnographic, that's anthropologic. Indigenous artists isn't, Indigenous art isn't contemporary. So there was, you know, all these barriers to navigate. And, um, you know, it was, it was really about creating a sovereign space for ourselves and thinking about how we show our work, who do we show it to, how do we show it in community um, and uh, we established a collective called Nation to Nation in the 90s, early 90s. And that eventually turned into a bigger project as we moved within a national scope and Native Love became a uh, coast to coast traveling exhibition that I primarily took on management with Skowanati. So you have to understand also this is when you're typing letters to artists, this is when you're faxing, this is when you call after six, when the, the, the rates are cheaper. It, it, it was a very cumbersome and laborsome task. Yeah. And we ended up managing, I think, uh, a tour of five venues with 38 artists. Wow. So that was sort of like the first moment where I I realized maybe I should step aside from the art practice because as a printmaker, I was working in a very small matrix of, of, of you know, prints that I was putting out versus the installation and the trends that were happening in the art world. Like I couldn't compete with that at that time. So I sort of thought about how to become that mediator for the spaces and creating spaces for Indigenous art. Okay. And um, just really quickly here, um, what prompted your decision to apply and attend Bard? Um, you're in this very like, renowned um, curatorial program. And I'm wondering, obviously the work that you did um, before yeah, I, was, that period. I mean, I, I had a ten-year curatorial practice prior mm -hmm. to going back to school to do a, a master's degree, 
Um, one of the reasons, I, well, I was working with the federal government with the uh, indigenous art collection, mm -hmm. uh, installing at least 10 exhibitions a year, acquiring artwork for the collection, producing catalogs, and uh, was being reached out by many people to do a consultation because people were now starting to pick up after 1990 and 1992. How do you implement Indigenous art within the work, within their workplace? Mm -hmm. And there was one moment where I was like, I'm doing all the work for you. I'm curating your exhibition. So why don't you make me a co-curator? And they outright said, you're not qualified. And this is in, this is in nine, this is in like 2000. So those hierarchies within the field were still there, like the majority of curators were still white art historians, white ethnographers, or white anthropologists. And there was, you know, to make room wasn't on their mind. I don't think it, I was mining me as a resource to help develop what they wanted. So I figured, you know, I, I started doing research and I found Bard. I found the brochure for Bard. It was one of the first places to offer a curatorial degree. I said, if I'm gonna go back, I don't wanna be an art historian. I wanna continue with the practice that I'm doing. And, um, you know, they, 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 they had a good recruitment uh, thing that spoke to me. Like, you'll meet Lucy Lepard. You'll work with Thelma Golden, you know? So there was like this list of the Whitney Biennial cultural wars that was stamped yeah. all over this brochure and I said okay this looks like the place that I can go like and and you know and sadly it wasn't the place that I expected right <laughs> I I did my time I came in I did my exhibition I argued with everybody uh I you know very little relationships came out I I had to you know it, it was all about the New York art world. If people weren't coming from New York, they didn't matter. And if and then when I presented my artists, the 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 dismissal of who I was bringing forward for my thesis was clear that they never heard of these people, they weren't interested, and. Uh, so it was a matter of just moving through this and getting the degree. I call it like getting a license because you say, you say Bard and people's eyes perk up. And uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a very expensive exercise, I have to say. <laughs> um, Heather, I'm going to put those uh, questions to you now. Well, um, I landed at I I after a lot of um, uh, significant personal familial sort of uh, situations that were not fantastic and not worth going into, but it had completely derailed my um, initial ambitions into the sciences, and I needed to find a I needed to find a new path. And I have always loved art, and I have always loved writing, um, and have loved poetry, and um, so I went to II in 1991, so on the heels uh, behind Ryan, and uh, was there during a really interesting time, I think, for II. I look forward to them celebrating the 90s as much as they do the 60s generation that they do. Um, I think there's a real value in thinking about um, the students who came after TC Cannon, but um, I think one of the things that happened for me was that um, I am somebody who gets very hyper-focused and um, also I was there at a time when I had no money and thank God the music, the, the school at the time offered free uh, uh, residency and free meals and free tuition if you could prove that you were a tribal citizen, which I'm able and was able to go to school and get a degree at that time. It was just an associate's degree. But I was there at a time that was incredibly, I think, quite exciting. Marie Watt was there. Deka he Heen Maynard was there. Um, there were just a lot of artists who are now doing, you know, I think quite well um, uh, at the early part of their careers. And seeing them, 
I just went all in as a writer. Um, and one of the things that I needed to do was earn money. So I wrote um, the local uh, Santa Fe reporter and the magazine would pay me 50 bucks if I do a review of an exhibition. And of course they have lots of exhibitions. So the pay for the reviews were never very much. And as you said in the beginning, I um, descended from a strong line, uh, a long line of strong Choctaw women. And I would add strong opinionated Choctaw women. So I've always had opinions, whether they were good or not, you know, is it's is debatable. But um, what did I know about writing a review about art? I looked at their reviews and the reviews that were being done of native art shows in Santa Fe, which there is uh, an abundance of very rarely had any understanding or knowledge about what the native components of the imagery or the uh, cultural references were. So um, I figured I could do as good a job as anybody else and um, started doing that. As soon as I graduated, I got a job scooping ice cream at the haagen on the plaza because I got to pay rent. And the director of the museum at that time, his name is Paul Rainbird, um, he came one day and he's like, when's your break? I'm like, I could take my break now. We went outside and we negotiated for me to come to the museum, um, the Institute of American Indian Arts Museum, which is now the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, um, to write for their marketing department, um, which was me and one other person. And um, that was a really fantastic experience because within that two year window that I worked in that position, um, I went to it really thinking, I'm gonna learn everything I can that's out there written about native art. And I spent six months and I read everything. I read everything by Janet Burlow. I read everything by Aldona Janitis. I wrote everything by Ruth Phillips um, and Jack Rushing had not come through yet. He was actually still in the PhD program in that moment. And so really read everything in 1993 that was published. And after six months, I was like, well, damn, I can be mediocre in this field and still have a great impact because <laughs> yeah. there's so little out there. And I'm like, this is my path. I'm going to write about Native art. And uh, really, I had no idea what a curator was. Um, interestingly, Marie Watt was the curator at the museum, the curator of education at the museum at the time. And she and I forged a friendship. Um, I She helped me to understand because she had an art history degree. I didn't even know you got degrees in art history like who knew? And um, I had to build a whole, like as an adult, I had to build my understanding of how museums function, what the backgrounds are. Um, meanwhile, I've got a family started. I got homesick. I moved home to Oklahoma, um, where I finished an undergraduate degree actually in printmaking. And I agree with you, Ryan. I think printmaking, because it is really a, requires planning, it requires really having all the steps laid out before you start the work. It's a really great medium to guide people into <laughs> what it takes to be a curator. But I then um, came home to Oklahoma, finished a degree in printmaking. Um, the day after graduation, found out I was pregnant with my second child and really needed to figure out how to pay bills. I went to work for a nonprofit um, as an administrator, got that sort of period of time to take care of my family and just be the primary breadwinner and and really spent a lot of time um, praying. Every day I went out and I'm like asking the ancestors to guide me on a path that would serve my community and also do something good. Like that was my prayer every day. It's the simplest and probably stupidest thing to ask, right? Because you put yourself vulnerable to whatever it is that the ancestors want you to do. But I went out and for about a year, I prayed every day and it became clearer and clearer to me that I needed to go back and get a degree in art history as a graduate student. I went back, I got a master's and before I had finished my master's program, I had conceived of a traveling exhibition um, of contemporary native art because one of the things I had seen working in Santa Fe was that there were so many amazing artists from Oklahoma who were making their living outside of our state, but could not, nobody even knew their name in our state. And they couldn't sell anything to buy a, a tank of gas. Like there was no market here. And that to me was a freaking crime. So I came back and I 
built this plan. I had amazing artists like who were willing to let me borrow their artwork. And I literally would go and install it in all these rural communities around the state. It got adopted as part of the state centennials celebration as a centennial project and really got a lot of um, notoriety and attention. And we ended up doing our final installation at the state Oklahoma Historical Society's galleries. And we had a great attendance at that. Um, and it really was for me in the end, it was recognizing in my community here in Oklahoma, a lack of representation in the arts. And I wanted to have, I wanted our artists to have their stories told. I want our native community to have their stories told. Curating is a path to be a storyteller. And it draws upon my love of writing because I have to write every day. I write, if not just an email, I'm writing an essay or a label or a narrative for a grant proposal, but it also um, gives me an opportunity to really push beyond what curation has been and to think about what, um, and it's opened for me the opportunity and this position at FAM has opened up for me the opportunity to imagine um, as Will Wilson says, he came to photography going like if indigenous people had invented photography, how would it be different? And I really sort of embraced that, uh, you know, for curating. If, if we were, could do curating in any way that is right for us, what would that look like? And um, First Americans Museum has been a platform for me to um, imagine that, to fabricate it, uh, to explore it and to continue to push for um, our indigenous philosophies to be at the center of what uh, our work as an institution and with the communities. So you both have uh, sort of circled around this already a bit, but I'm still gonna ask what may seem to be a very obvious question, like what informed your decision to focus on the study and presentation of indigenous art? And like Heather, since you have just finished and you were sort of moving in that direction, I'm gonna ask you to respond first. Well, I'm gonna tell you that I get, um, I get a lot of criticism. I don't want anybody to think that I walk around and like all I get is pats on the back. I get plenty of criticism. But even within the criticism that I do receive and beyond that, the encouragement that I get from the artists that I'm helping them to communicate something to people that is already present within their artwork, but that I help people to come to it with an understanding that they didn't come to it with. And I don't think artists should have to interpret their work for audiences. Um, I think generally speaking though, there's a lot of people who don't have enough knowledge of um, more than just mainstream, um, you know, US American social standards to really even engage with native art uh, beyond that sort of superficial, what are the materials made out of? What are the, you know, is it have a bird on it? Or, you know, those very sort of elementary things. So it's really the encouragement from the artists and then, um, and equally as important to me is the encouragement from the community. And when I have, um, I've told this story before, so I'll, I'll keep it short for anybody who's already heard it. I don't want to bore them, but, you know, I've been in situations where I'm in like a, a cultural gathering, not as Heather Autone, the curator, but as Heather Autone, you know, niece or granddaughter, or, you know, I'm just, I'm literally, if somebody comes to the camp, it's my job to make sure they get a fresh cup of coffee and, a, you know, a Danish or whatever, and hospitality, right? Like I'm just trying to put that out there or I'm cooking or whatever. And I've had people from the community, I don't know, walk up and say, I know who you are and I know what you do and I'm watching you. And that's an accountability that um, literally probably almost made me pee on myself the first time I heard it. And since then I embrace it. Like you keep watching because we're gonna keep doing good work and I'm gonna continue to push the boundaries to make sure that our indigenous people are well represented in the spaces that I have any any you know authority over, um, and I'm going to share that authority as far as and as wide as I can within the tribal nations and the tribal communities. Um, so it is something to have people watching you who are part of your 
cultural community who are maybe extended members of your family and have them telling you, you know, you better do well. You're representing us and we're not all able to be at that table. When I'm sitting at a table, I keep that in mind and I take it very seriously. And it is to me a form of encouragement at this point. And I hope they keep watching and I hope other people keep coming to it. I guess my answer would be more along the lines of leaving Santa Fe with a portfolio of work that I was very proud of, mm -hmm. uh, putting that out in the world and getting attention through the work that I was, I made and was continuing to make within printmaking. And uh, I, I received quite a lot of opportunities showing my work in different capacities, getting into collections, acquisitions that were targeting Indigenous art at the time. Uh, twice my work was used nationally for posters. Uh, and then I won this, um, I won this contest. I think it was year of International Year of Women or Decade of the Women something like that and 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 i submitted to this uh, call a, re a request for qualifications shortlisted i got the i got the gig and i had to meet with people within the government to review the image that i was going to create and it kept being pushed away from anything that i would actually do and it made me think about how my representation as an artist, being from Ganawage, being Mohawk, at the time right after the Oka crisis, how we're never represented within Quebec, how we're, you know, we're still fighting for our territory, you know, within a French regime. Uh, so people kept tell, like telling me what it should be and what it could be. Mm -hmm. But no one was telling the last person who got the poster that was very West Coast aesthetic that it was too West Coast aesthetic because it was something that people became to understand as Indigenous art. Yeah. Mine wasn't, right? So uh, the, it ended up the man who was in charge of the program was actually from Six Nations. And when I finally presented the final uh, image, Mm -hmm. he was very hesitant and then he said oh it's it's oh so Iroquois and I'm like well that's who I am so that's what I'm presenting and that became one of the titles of one of my exhibition <laughs> because it, it fed it impacted me because I was pushed aside for being who I was and then I wanted to challenge what that meant, what, what does an aesthetic mean? What does a common aesthetic that is placed on you to represent you versus what an artist can do, right? So, you know, so, you know, it came from there and it, and it came building through how we represent ourselves. I mean, Nation to Nation was clearly uh, a response to how we are perceived after the Oka crisis. Like Ganawage was in this moment of siege and we had to, it was a moment of actually, I, as I was part of the community to bring a, a powwow there the, for the first time, because powwow didn't exist in our community. Powwow was very pan west of us. And uh, there was a call for community members to come out and, uh, you know, let, let's try to do this powwow. And because I was in Santa Fe and I went to Oklahoma and I've been in Arizona and I've been in these powwows and I've seen the extent of the gathering that it creates, I joined the committee and, and that powwow is since 1991. So it's, it's still growing and continuing. And I think that is when you think of reconciliation, it was a form of us taking the step towards reconciliation because it was also a matter of how do we uh, bridge the relationships that we had or ha will have in the future with our neighboring communities who, you know, through the whole situation became our enemies to some extent. Mm -hmm. So it was always through the idea of representation and through a lens of the type of work that I was interested in pushing forward and then finding others like me that were pushing in a different manner in a different medium and how to how to create that so native love became a way of 
us showing us ourselves as vulnerable people, as caring people, rather than as militants with machine guns and, and camouflage and, and face masks. So, so it was all about, you know, flipping the script kind of. Um, so, and I apologize because there's so much I want to follow up on, but I have like this long list of questions and I want to make sure that we hit all of them. So I apologize for not asking the follow-up question, <laughs> but like, there's so much here I want to delve into, but again, we're going to, I think we're going to return to these threads in, in the, the latter part of the conversation. So you have both held positions. Um, I'm just going to use this generic title of curator of indigenous art in non-indigenous institutions. And then you've also worked as curators in spaces that are dedicated um, towards exclusively showcasing the work of indigenous arts uh, artists. And I'm wondering if you can speak about the differences in those experiences. And uh, maybe I'll ask you to start, Heather. Okay. Um... So I think at the core of it is the um, the level of support I have to build projects from an Indigenous philosophical foundation. And um, I'm going to do that because that's how I want to be as a professional, drawing upon my own cultural identity. I wouldn't ask mm -hmm. someone to come from their, a different culture and not draw upon the strengths of all the goodness that their ancestors have given them. But I have been challenged to try and make that possible in institutions that are not um, Indigenous spaces. Um, and so it, you know, prior to working at FAM, I was at the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art. It's at the University of Oklahoma, which is a huge, huge student population. I think they have like, I think the numbers maybe 1,600 native students at OU and a huge faculty representation and staff representation. The native community at the university is really um, quite a, kind of wonderful and I miss it. Um, I don't miss it enough to go back, but um, just to say that I had a lot of support on campus for the work I was doing. I had support from our local native community, but sometimes within the institution, um, there was this pushback that um, that perspective was not appropriate for the university. And I constantly had to do a um, little bit of um, uh, negotiating, I think, or navigating how to make sure that I was bringing that in, even sometimes when I didn't necessarily name it. And I found that at the Fred Jones, if I didn't call it an indigenous project and I just simply brought that philosophy to play, the concepts, the curatorial concepts would be uh, actually quite warmly embraced. And so I would sort of shield the projects by not naming them that way, but bringing that philosophy to play as I cultivated the projects and navigated the relationships, the artists and the artwork. Um, and I feel like that was the probably the biggest thing. Here I at First Americans Museum, we have a majority native leadership. I'm part of the executive um, leadership where have um, a majority native board of directors and here they're like go I have encouragement at every level to push that idea of what how to bring that indigenous philosophy into play and to help foster the vocabulary that I would I feel like that's one of the things that's missing in institutions is the vocabulary to bring that philosophy into into um to activate it within the space because you know museums institutions are by their very nature um colonialist projects and mm -hmm. so like we have done a lot of renaming of things in our institution and these are not necessarily the terms that i've come up with but we've created an openness to thinking about how we will do the work we are doing and so you know like within our collections we talk about the um um, the objects as living objects. We uh, think about the relatives that they have. Um, we have been really challenged, to, for instance, to get our CMS um, here 
to function in a way that reflects that kind of intellectual approach to the items, including mm -hmm. being able to use indigenous language within our um, collections management system. Um, but I don't think that those things are impossible. I don't think that they're out of reach. And I simply think that in, for the most part, and I don't know, Ryan, if you would agree with me, a lot of times I think these are just questions that have, have not had the opportunity to be asked. And if we are collectively and willfully looking towards what we want, as we clarify that for ourselves, that we will make those changes. And I have been told some of the things that I'm making changes for here internally are actually beneficial to museums that have, for instance, Asian collections um, and the Asian curators are interested in same kinds of issues, you know, and the, um, you know, I just think that those are things that a lot of what museums are foundationally built on are um, a Western philosophical approach. And once we move past that sort of Western cultural uh, European centered paradigm and open it up to the discussion that needs to happen with the global majority of indigenous people everywhere, I think we're going to change things in a way that is beneficial that can't even be imagined if we try to just work within the boxes that exist currently. I don't know, Ryan, if you think that's. No, I totally agree. I think the boxes that, I mean, are so systemic that people just get a uncomfortable moving out of another box or adding another box. It's like a spreadsheet, right? It's like add another cell. Mm -hmm. And that other cell will just allow you to identify a work much, much more clearer and much more precise. So like I was just in conversations last week about decolonizing database systems, right, for, for museums. And I'm like, well, I always worked with contemporary art. So we never had to distinguish artifact, object, ritual, mm -hmm. sacredness. And I said, if you're a contemporary museum and that's your goal, why are you taking in these objects? Mm -hmm. Maybe these objects should go be going back out into the community right away because mm -hmm. what are you doing with them? And they're not going to mm -hmm. actually be activated within your space. And then I guess to your question, I've within the within the framework of me entering a space that is not uh, indigenous specific or mainstream, I always came in with a checkout date. Right. So I was always welcome until it expired. And it was either through a project or through a time frame. So like a residency is two years, a residency is one year, a fellowship is one year. So they kind of know that you're you're on your way out. And yeah. I think the mistake there is there were many opportunities to invest in me to maintain me within certain spaces, you know, cause when I leave or when I left, you see sort of like a deficit in what was happening. And, and one of the places I went, you know, I was, I was tasked to do one exhibition and I did four exhibitions and they all toured for a, a few years. So I knew that there was a necessity across the country that people were looking for this and, and I was able to create that. Um, within indigenous spaces, which I, which I'm indigenous sort of like sanctioned spaces, like I worked within the government, federal government. So that was completely not within indigenous space, but we created it or we, we came to it as an indigenous space. And when I was with the federal government, the indigenous art center was actually at that time was being guided by all indigenous staff. It collapsed after that, um, and you see very little, uh, you know, we don't see much about this collection. It's a very, like, limited known collection across the country. Um, and then my stint at uh, the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe was sort of, it was always something, it was always a desire for me to return to Santa Fe, just because I seen the capacity of what... Uh, art can do, indigenous art has the, the the power to do in many different ways. And I wanted to be part of that. And I and I felt like my relationship there and being from away would also impact that. 
I mean, it was a very challenging space to work at because in many ways I was seen as an outsider. I was seen as Canadian. I was seen as someone who was changing things. Uh, and that was my goal. I, I entered the space with, with that goal. And I based it on my experience of being from the Northeast coming to the Southwest and how the student body all should have something to aspire to to go to that museum and to see work from Seattle area, to go see work from by Inuit artists, to go see. So I was really interested in about the diversity of bringing indigenous and then even going global after that. So, so, so things were shifting from a very regional or local that it was for quite some time to, to more expansive, relatively consistent. So that, that was sort of like, you know, it, it was, you, it, you know, and, and when I left, people said, oh, we finally got what you were trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm going to skip ahead of some of my uh, questions just in the interest of time. Um, so we're at a particular moment where there are a lot of um, Indigenous objects and artwork by practicing um, contemporary artists in institutional collections. And many institutions across Canada and the US um, have indigenous staff, they either have um, indigenous curators on staff, indigenous educators, um, people working in interpretation or um, community engagement from indigenous communities. And um, regardless of that, there are still these barriers and the types of challenges that you've alluded to in your earlier responses, Ryan. Um, there are issues still with interpretation, um, with, um, I don't know, I guess thoughtful modes of display in exhibitions and also around retaining staff. And I'm wondering if this is like a big question, but I'm wondering if, um, if you even just wanted to take up a part of it um, to kind of respond to it, like what needs to shift? What is the work that, um, what is the work that still remains to be done to shift this? And, and obviously this is not, it's kind of an unfair question because this isn't, it's not fair to be asking you this as indigenous practitioners, right? There's work that the rest of us have to do in, like while acknowledging that some of us are fighting similar battles um, within these spaces. But yeah, I'll turn that over to you. I, I guess I about that, Ryan. Do you, are you ready? Go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm, I always think that uh, like the relationship an institution has to Indigenous people is quite significant or should be quite significant and responsible and respectful. Um, but we know that's not the case. And why they're so behind is, is beyond me because um, their expectation is to give one person the job to manage everything. Mm -hmm. So when you look at, you look at these job, these job postings that are coming out and you're like, you're curating exhibitions, you're managing a collection and you're doing repatriation. That's three different jobs with assistant staff. And, and they expect entry level to come in and do that. So you're you're looking at burnout and you're not looking at investment when their assets are our assets, right? So the cultural belongings that are being held in these places um, should have the proper care and, and need to be invested in as much as a dinosaur dinosaur bone does. Like you you look at a dinosaur section in a certain museum and you see how many staff members there are mm -hmm. versus the indigenous collection whose land you're sitting on and they can't even fill the role. <laughs> so, you know, there's these, these situations where it's not tenable to bring in one person. You have to bring in a staff, a unit, a department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you know, and allyship works in these cases in many ways. Like we we experience allyship in our in our work anyway, but I think there needs to be a lead in that 
in terms of how to understand what direction it wants to go because otherwise it can very, stay very stasis. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump in, I, I hear a gap. So I'm gonna jump in because I have such strong opinions about this. And um, I think one of the things is that, uh, so I'm gonna build on what Ryan just said because what he just said is you need to put time, money and people to invest in this and that is, not defined by a, any individual person. If you looked at any museum across the country, all those responsibilities do not rest on any single individual's shoulders in these large institutions that are, you know, making space, which I, I'm grateful that they are making space and intentionally hiring indigenous people into these roles, but they're in, hiring individual indigenous museum workers into responsibilities that cannot be fulfilled. So they're being brought in really to fail. And it's almost like if we bring in these native curators and they fail, then we can say we did what we were supposed to, but it didn't work. So we're gonna go back to how we've done it in the past. And there's a churning going on in the field right now of native curators, native, um, and there's not, a, a you know, um, I think a lot of people think, oh, there's native curators, there must be native people in all the other fields. There are not enough native exhibition designers, period. I am, I've got a couple that I like to work with and I'm like, you know, those guys are making a killing off of what we're doing, you know, and I'm putting them out to the other museums because they're like, who are you working with? Book designers, graphic designers, development people, people in the education fields within the museums. And, you know, even as a curator, if you put together a great exhibition and you have a educational team come in and interpret that and there's nobody there with any kind of cultural sensitivities and and Ryan's absolutely right we have to have allies who are open to learning new approaches and interpretive or interpretive models in order not to like just completely squelch whatever beauty that we've brought in even as curators and so you know museum work is very collaborative it's very interdisciplinary um and it's and it's a challenge right now um, I think that an individual can come into a position and if there is, there are allies, and I'm going to just continue to use that word because I think it's so critical, um, within the museum leadership that prioritize the work and are willing to say, not just here's the job and we want you to do this, but here's the job, what do you need to do this? So that then the clarity of, okay, Here's what here's what I see you're asking me to do, but I need this, and you know I need this support. I need an additional staff person, um, and then investing the money into that to be able to do it well are critical. And so, those you know indigenous curators um, represent vision and perspective that are needed within the galleries, but that is not the end of the work that we are asked to do. And I think we need to have that support. Um, and then I'm just going to say additionally, in addition to like, as these positions are being created and as people are coming into the spaces, um, we're not being asked simply to work. And I don't know, Ryan, you're going to have to correct me because I really don't want to misrepresent the field broadly, but we're often leveraging our personal relationships within the community to the benefit of the artists and the work. Um, so the network of artists that we know, the network of, you know, financial supporters that we know, but also the networks within the tribal communities, especially when, and Sally, you mentioned, you know, the collections that are out there and when people are being asked to help manage, um, as in the U.S. that we have right now, some um, federal regulations that were rewritten and handed down in J January that said, you can't have anything on view if you don't have the evidence that you, the community gave you permission to put these sensitive items on view. And one of the things that I see paramount in this is the kind of tools, both for research, documentation, tracking the relationships that we're cultivating. And we're building some of those tools here at FAM, and I'm happy to help people as much as I can. And we're talking about right now, um, actually making a resource page on our website that people can come to them so they don't have to email. So I don't have to answer an email, another email about a request over how are you doing this? 
we do have, we have cultivated relationships with the 39 tribes in Oklahoma. Those aren't perfect relationships. We're still building them. Relationships are built over time and they're built on trust and we're still building all of that. But one of the things that I see critically, and we had a conversation today, is that there is absolutely a need for some kind of digital resource that we could use where the, those relationships cannot be, and I as a curator do not want to be the gateway for those relationships to the tribes. And given that, other departments, other personnel within the museum need to be able to have relationships so that they're like multi-pronged relationships with the tribal nations, but there are no digital tools. There are no um, mechanisms right now, by like software where we can say, okay, here's this tribe, here's who's the public affairs office, here's the veterans office, here's the um, you know, TIPO office, here's the cultural com committee, um, here's the tribal leaders information, and who are we all, across our institution within different departments, where are all these conversations going? And right now we don't have a way of tracking them. And I've been talking with, um, I've been talking about this for a year. Like this is not me being a gate person, gatekeeper. And I can't do that role. I don't want that role. But I also don't want the relationships with the tribes to be tarnished because somebody in our institution went to the wrong person and, you know, and it ticked someone off. And quite frankly, these relationships are still too vulnerable to those sorts of um, interpersonal exchanges that could run afoul and put us in a position where we cannot have the kind of conversations uh, about sensitive materials and, and topics that we need to be able to have to continue to foster the projects that we're doing here. And so that's um, that's something like beyond simply just time, money, and people. It is also thinking about like what are the tools that are out there. And when everything is like one single authority, there is this perception that in the tribal nations there's one single authority. And the truth is that should not be true at the museum. And it is absolutely not the truth in the tribal nations. So anyway, that's my that's my current sort of white flag. I'm like trying to figure out how we're going to build a software that can address this issue. And I've talked about it for a while and there's some other institutions that are also similarly interested. And I think there's a real need for it. Definitely. Um, Ryan, did you wanna say something in response to that? No, I think we can move along like, yeah. Okay, okay. so what I can do, I have two last questions that I'm gonna smush together to pretend that they're one. Um, but I also feel like maybe we should open it up for questions. And I'm hoping that no one will ask a question because then I can ask my questions. But um, if anyone who is on the call is watching and would like to ask a question, you can just enter it into the chat and we'll respond. And actually, while we're pausing, I'm going to insert my questions here. So here, here is my last question, which is really two questions. You can decide which part you want to respond to. One is, is there a project, like a dream project, whether it's a publication or an exhibition or just something um, that you would like to do, such as uh, the initiative that you just mentioned, Heather, that, that is kind of on the back burner for now, but you would like to do before you leave the field? And the other question is, or the other part is, what are your hopes for the field? either for younger people who are following you, um, for institutions, um, and maybe even the ways in which you work in it. Do you have hopes in terms of how you will be able to expand or, um, I don't know, maybe adjust uh, some of the work that you're doing? I, we're both pointing at you. <laughs> You want me to go first, Ryan? That will give you the last word as a okay. <laughs> um, um, I, you know, building a museum, and for those who have not been to FAM, this is the museum behind me. The, the this is structure that you're seeing here is actually two stories. So that'll give you a sense of the scale of the institution. It's 173,000 
square feet. And we've got some really grand exterior spaces that um, we're doing some programming in, some um, site specific installations in. And, you know, having an opportunity, how many people get to do help build a museum? What has emerged out of this experience is that I would really love to cultivate first Americans museum. And if not here, I would love to see somebody do it somewhere else. I'm, I don't preview. I don't, I don't think ideas only belong to one person. So um, I would love there to be generated a model that allows the multiplicity of perspectives emerging from the global majority into um, shared space within museums that engages the voices of community members, indigenous nations, and really thinking about um, how to celebrate our shared human experience through the arts and culture. Um, if I have uh, any longevity here at this institution, I've been here six years now, and you know, I'm always, I'll be honest, I'm always expecting to get fired. So um, the thing I would love to do is I would love, love to create um, a space at FAM where we can cultivate a global indigenous cultural exchange that engages um, obviously the arts and, and but also um, thinking about the um, potential for um, relationships an examination of the relationships to materials, right? Like um, I've had conversations with a friend of mine who's a Sami curator and they have such a deep and abiding relationship to the reindeer that is, um, as she described it, I felt like a very close affinity to, in Oklahoma, our Cheyenne and Arapaho community have a bison herd that they take care of that both feeds them, but also is an extension of a creation story as is theirs. And so thinking about these relationships to these materials sources and our natural, rel the relatives in the natural world um, and examining, you know, our life ways and practices in a way that says, hey, we're gonna, we do things a little bit differently, but there is a shared core of our human experience that can be celebrated through this and taking it beyond um, some of the limits that are currently imposed on many institutions, which is you know your local audience, your um, regional audience, and maybe you have a national audience, but I would really love to sort of sidestep all of that and think about the global intercultural exchange that could happen and what might come and emerge out of that. Yeah, I guess um, I actually just just calendared probably a last show before I retire. So I'm already I'm already like five years out in my calendar with with my projects. And it, it's something that I know, you know, all of a sudden it came on my mind and it's like, okay, yeah, there's a time to go. Right. And I think for me, when I, when I made the decision to leave Santa Fe, I actually didn't have anything to go to when I made the decision and two things came up right after I made the decision of what was one was to come to OCAD, um, and the other one is to go to be the fellow at the Art Gallery of uh, Greater Victoria. So I had these two mm -hmm. options. I managed to keep both of them. 10 years later, I'm in my fourth position at OCAD. Um, and I managed to do the fellowship at Art Gallery of Victoria. And that's where I created a, a, a project that I, I was really interested in pursuing. And the title is called Pale Face. And I wanted to play with those ideas of stereotypes and representation from the way that Indigenous artists are depicting non-Indigenous people. And through my fellowship at Ar Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, which didn't have any works that spoke to that, you know, I start looking at Oscar Howe's piece. Um, I start looking, I have a list, a slew of images and I started out from a very naive or very like wanting to be coexistent, peaceful, following the Turo Wampum like philosophy of side by side. And I started with a piece by Shelley Nero. 
Uh, and it was about the mother of nations that she showed in my exhibition, Counting Coup in Santa Fe. And I, I was like, okay, like let's look at the two paths on how we can assess a historical narrative of how we look at each other, right? And through my research, the outcome would have been very, very violent. Like I couldn't stay away from like a peaceful coexistence. It, it immediately, the representations that I was seeing and the important works I was seeing were very violent. And I was like, and I was having conversations when I was out at Art Gallery Greater Victoria and I'm like, who would take this show? And this is 10 years ago. And it was like, they weren't interested even though I was there. And, you know, it sat in my pocket and, and I still think it's something worthy. Like it's it's always on my mind. Uh, I'm always looking for those pieces, but it's 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 a matter of who would want it, to, who wants to take this on? Because I think it's a it's a really big, like to understand those relationships, you know, is is, is unpacking a lot of historical uh situations and, and I just had Janet Dees last week talk about her exhibition a site of struggle so I was thinking about you know how historical do I want to go how contemporary will it be so so you know I was grappling with all of those and, and that's been on my mind for 10 years and I, and I still think about it still look for it um but also my time at leaving Santa Fe and going to OCAD I realized how critical education is to an art experience for me as a curator, like um, stepping in and, and doing the tours are sort of like gratifying to me. Like, you know, I don't hesitate to do that anymore where before I'm like, oh, read the label or there's no label or there's no didactic panel. And I really think about how people experience museums and going back to Santa Fe is those students who are at IAIA the museum might have been the first time that they're going into a museum. And then the same thing at OCAD, I'm learning that a lot of students, it's the first time coming to a gallery, even though they're within the Toronto area. So, so I'm really thinking about curatorial hospitality, the impact uh, activating artworks, the curatorial premise. So, so, you know, thinking about that in a much stronger uh, capacity than I would at the beginning where I was more, you know, oh, it's artwork and you interpret it your own way or you're like, like I'm interested in the experience as well and, and, and the interaction. Thank you. Um, so you've already, you've started answering this question. We did have a question in the Q and A and I know that um, we need to wrap up soon, but um, there is a question. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name um, from Aylin Kuchi. Um, what advice would you both give to emerging curators breaking into the scene in terms of a starting point and any pertinent information that they should know or understand about the industry? Miigwech. I would I would say I mean curatorial is work curatorial practice is work uh, it's an ethic of labor um, it's 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 and especially trying to break into the field it, it's a matter of building your resume like you know it's it's opportunities are different now than they were in the past calls are calls are more immediate they're more tenable because we're working on those calls to make it more accessible. So, you know, following these streams, I mean, I, you still don't see the AGO putting out a call for a curator or, you know, it's all within the DIY spaces, artist run spaces, the ambition to, to put forward your proposals, to hard call somebody and say, are you interested? That's what I did. I would just call people, are you interested or not? <laughs> I'll move on to the next place. Like, you know, I have I have slews of rejected proposals, but it's a matter of just building that up, building your reputation, building that up. You know, everything from fellowship to internship to mentorship to apprentice, like those all have to exist. But but it's labor. It, it's it's 
for me, it was labor. It, it's it's still, you know, it it's it's a lot of work, and I and I know Heather does a lot of work. Like you know, you see the building behind her, you know, building these spaces that didn't exist before, whether they're architecture or just you know, it it there's a lot of work that that has been done and still needs to be done. You know, Ryan, I know you're in a, a major, um, you know, urban space and I'm in a space that I wouldn't call a major urban space. I mean, Oklahoma City's got, you know, a million and a half people. So we're just not quite as dense. Um, and um, the I, and I'm not quite sure where the question is coming from geographically. So I'm going to just say that I think everything you said is spot on. If you are in a place that maybe doesn't have so many institutions that um, have opportunities for you to apply to, um, I, one of the things that I often give young curators, you know, I get this question on a regular basis here, um, you know, as the universities bring in their art history students or whatnot, you know, they're like, what was the best, ex you know, what was the best things that helped you to prepare to be a curator? And so there's two things that I'm going to add to what you said, and I want to both of them grow off of your comment that this is to be a curator is you have to have an ethic of work. You have to be willing to do the work of it. Do not come and ask me for a job. If I'm going to have to ask you why you missed a deadline, like it's the work of it and you have to work hard to make sure you do the, do it. But I think there's an alternate ways. And one is that there are art is everywhere. And there are opportunities, even in rural spaces, to say, hey, I want to bring art here. And going, I don't, I can't describe to you how many times when I, I did, um, before I worked at the Fred Jones Museum, I had been curating for a dozen years in my community, in a place that doesn't have a lot of art spaces. And I literally would go to, um, you know, libraries, I would go to um, bars, you described having um, an exhibition in a hair salon. There are spaces, space, and if there are walls, you can be a curator and you can make it happen. And when I was um, competing for the position I had at the Fred Jones, I was the only person that was a finalist. I found out later, I was the only finalist that didn't have a PhD, but I had a more extensive, active, um, CV representing all of the projects that I had been doing. And so the proof was in the pudding. I was going to do the work and I could get paid by them to do the work or I could do it on my own. And I was going to continue to do that. So I do think that one doesn't have to only imagine being a curator as working in an institution, that it is simply a matter of deciding that you want to help the artists or you want to create space for those art artists to have room and stepping into that. And I think that that's something that really can be done anywhere in a lot of different ways. And it can be valuable in whether or not you're working with a whole framework and infrastructure of an education team and a marketing team. Um, it's just a matter of like stepping up and doing the work yourself. And then the second thing is, is that I've been asked, um, and this is not exactly the answer I think that anybody is going to be expecting, but I will say this is that I've been asked by a lot of young wannabe emerging curators, like what was the uh, job that helped me prepare the most to be a curator and the job that really, and, and, you know, I agree with you, Ryan, printmaking has a real, um, I think relevance in that sense of planning, but I am a good curator, a mediocre curator that could be argued. I'm not going to argue, but I do what I do. A lot of the juggling that I do, that skill was cultivated as being a waitress and helping to make sure that the food was served hot and that people were satisfied. And I use those same skills I used as a waitress to make sure that donors are satisfied, that the exhibition projects are delivered on time. And all of the things that we're thinking about of like uh, generating these relationships with tribes and whatnot, it really comes out of um, a desire that does is was not even present and possible in an institution, I don't think 20 years ago. Even at IAI's museum, it would have been a challenge to do the kind of scope of work that I'm doing now here at FAM. I think that you've got to imagine the world and the kinds of projects you wanna do. And you can't imagine doing things at the scale or level that Ryan and I are doing 
without doing small things and baby step building up your capacity. And so um, I wouldn't be so worried about the big calls. I think if you want to be a curator, you got to get out there and just do the damned work. Well, on that note, I <laughs> would like, <laughs> I would like to- no, Ryan's um, supposed to have the last word. Let Ryan say something. <laughs> Ryan, do you have any last words? Build your skills. I mean, the practical skills are what is missing. We're yes. mean, I mean, at Bard, no one showed you how to use a hammer. Uh, mm -hmm. when I, when I taught the work of the curator, which is a practical course, we started with how to use a tape measure. Those mm -hmm. skills are critical in the work that we do. Uh, we train our student monitor galleries who aren't even cu in curatorial work. They can install an exhibition within three weeks with, with our guidance. So they're learning all the practical skills of painting, which are all going to carry over into your career anyway. So I think any practical skill that you can bring to the table, whether it's graphic design, whether it's, uh, you know, like technology is critical today. So there, there's there's so many practical skills that are also required that will help you understand the architecture of your architecture of your space and then working with other people who you rely on in designing your exhibitions as well. And one of the things that you have both alluded to, um, but haven't explicitly said, is the importance of relationships, right? And and one of the things that I'm hearing as well is that in, there are still, unfortunately, some of the barriers and challenges that existed when we all first started out are still in existence now. But I think having those relationships with your communities, with artists, like fostering um, this kind of culture of respect through the work that you do in curating, like a lot of it is about relations. And, um, and I think those are the things that will sustain you when these challenges occur, whether it's, you know, yeah. you're curating. Then, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and you, you're also vulnerable. Just because you're the curator doesn't mean that you have to take the role on managing everything it, it's there's reciprocity involved you know and sometimes when you work with an artist you walk away from each other and you're done right you you, you, mm -hmm. you do work and that doesn't mean you have to have a friendship for life like, like yeah those yeah expectations happen on their own they they don't always have to happen like it, it's nice to run into people and artists that i've worked with and catch up but you know those relationships don't always have to be best friends or whatever. Heather? Um, well, absolutely. Respect um, is key for it and holding people accountable for the work that's needed to be done. And that, that doesn't, that's not anything related to cultural um, identity. Um, we can all do our work and we can all meet our deadlines and also that we can, um, I think be thinking about um, how those relationships fundamentally um, contribute to who, to our, um, I would, I, I've used this term before and I'm having a little trouble coming back to um, it before, but like the cultural currency that um, curators have within the community is really built up out of the support and trust that we build within the community, that's not just the tribal community. I mean, that's donor community. That's our colleagues within our institutions. It is, um, and um, that cultural that cultural currency is at the base of uh, the network of, of all of the resources that we can bring to bear within our work. And I think those are, uh, those relationships are critical. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to you both. Um, There's so many topics that I was hoping to touch on and also return to. So I'm hoping we could take this conversation up again at, at a future date. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. Uh, we have, um, I'll save Nicole the labor of doing this. Um, the Art Gallery of Wolf will be hosting another um, conversation in the speaker series next Thursday. Um, featuring Michelle Jakes, the chief curator at the Ramey Modern, and Kimberly Gant, who is the curator of contemporary art at the Brooklyn Museum 
But I just want to say um, to Ryan and Heather, it was a pleasure to walk down memory lane with you both, but to also hear about all of your exp experiences. This was such a really rich conversation. And um, I'm, I'm so glad that I get to be working in the field at a time when both of you are in it. Like, thank you for all of the work that you do and for sharing with us here tonight. All right. Good evening. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Bye, Heather. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Bye, you guys. Bye.